In the second episode of our podcast, we have discussed about smart cities and corporate sustainability with Anveshi, who is the CEO at Quest Sustainable Solutions, that is a social enterprise focusing on urban sustainable living. Listen till the end of this episode to find answers to questions like who decides what would be the concept of smart in a city? What is the skepticism about corporate sustainability? How can corporates in India support prisoners for sustainability initiatives and many such other questions. Welcome to It's About That Time, Anveshi. Yeah, Antika, thanks Thanks for having me here and uh, looking forward to this one. Great. So, Anveshi, I know you for a couple of months now and, you know, in all our previous discussions, uh, you've told me that you've been in this social impact consulting and IT industry for almost 20 years now, right? And have worked with enterprises that focused on urban sustainable living. And you've also led the smart cities consulting engagements for cities that were um, predominantly in developing markets, right? Now, before, you know, we discuss how you've been doing your part in this social sector, why don't you tell us your story How did you get started and why did you get started? What motivated you to be in this space? So honestly, uh, the space that we are in currently, me and uh, my my company that I head uh, in currently is something that hasn't been there for a long part of my career. Uh, So it it is an awakening of sorts that I've had over the last four or five years. Uh, But having said that, yes, the career path that you just mentioned, yes, I've gone through all of that tech consulting and, and then at some point had those aspirations to become an entrepreneur and that's where i think things have fallen in place today and uh, where i am today uh, smart cities is one area that i think i've been right. uh, passionately associated with for the last few years but otherwise even before that it was more of it consulting and business consulting for a lot of uh, my corporate clients that i was working with earlier through my employers that i was working with uh, yeah so today where we are we are focused on of course urban system sustainable living uh yeah that that's that's mm. the the broad crux of it i'm sure as you ask more questions i'm happy to give you more details of whatever you think would be relevant sure so uh you know you, you said that you were majorly focused on the sustainable uh cities or yep. the urban living parts right and yeah, you were yeah. also in the consulting industry so um you know uh for the young listeners listening to this podcast um mm-hmm. How did you, you know, understand that you would want to be in the consulting sector and, you know, sort of uh, built towards that? Yeah, so the consulting switch was something that happened very early in my career. I mean, this is not something that's very uh, a recent one, although the nature of what I was consulting for has changed. Like I said, at some point it was IT and process, IT processes and that kind of a consulting. Then it changed into business processes and business consulting. Then it changed into smart cities. And today where we are, I think we are now very laser sharp, having a laser sharp focus on uh, sustainable living and sustainability consulting. So yeah, the focus areas have only transitioned or, or uh, right. I would say, I would say there've been multiple pivot points there. But otherwise, uh, consulting happened way early in my career. Mm-hmm. Why and where did it start? I honestly don't have much of a recall. But I think it was so natural that I don't think there was a real okay. pivot point, so to say, on the consulting switch. Mm. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, Anvish, uh, you know, why don't you help us understand the concept of smart cities? Oh, sure. I mean, uh, each is own, I would say, to start with. And, uh, and by that, I mean uh, what you and me believe as a smart city could be very different from the person sitting right next to you or me on another day. So the point is uh, smart cities right. is not necessarily always tech. It's not necessarily always uh, always uh, one single problem. It, a city is, is so complex, quite honestly, and uh, more so in the developing world, uh, considering the, the fact that this, there's way too many dynamics at play. Uh, so, so in that kind of a context, what is smart for city A and the, uh, the, the perspective of a person who's looking at that particular city A could be very different from what's smart for city B and the same perspective of another person there. The, that's the kind of uh, uh, the the definition of smart that we could come up with. But having said that, in the context of what I've been involved in, uh, I was predominantly involved with uh, how tech could be a good enabler to make uh, cities much more livable. So that was my my prerogative. Uh, I 
had like you just mm. mentioned a while back i had worked on uh, uh, cities in india but even before that i had exposure to smart city engagements in the middle east and africa region so uh, definitely different contexts and different markets require different approaches and uh, there's no single definition for what a smart city would be about right so um you know can you tell us a little bit about one of the projects that you've done uh, on smart cities and what was the idea of smart in that particular city sure sure so i'll go way back to the middle east africa experience that i mentioned and probably even relate it as i'm narrating to what we're doing in the indian context mm -hmm. so this was johannesburg this was south africa that i'm referring to yeah. uh, they out there uh, uh, there is always a concern around uh, public safety and security because of the fact that there's a there's a a, a sense of a higher crime rate out there and uh, so uh, the mm. one of the problems that was definitely put to, put forth to us was to address that through whatever technology could do and this is this is where uh, my my leaning towards how cities could be made more livable through technology started so while there were other problems like waste and all of it waste and water and stuff but security angle was the bigger one and so we kind of looked at how that could be done and this was achieved through uh, implementation of a uh, command and control center which is essentially a place you could imagine where uh, a, a team sitting together in in a particular uh, huge room with multiple screens and they are watching over everything that's happening around the city through camera camera feed right and based on what they watch mm. based on the okay. alerts that the cameras are throwing to you at the center you start acting you start responding to those events by either sending out the right uh, rescue forces sending out the right uh, uh, forces who are called field uh, responders and uh, to address a certain situation so that's the that's the way we had leveraged technology but having relating it back to what we are doing and we were doing already for a good long five years now uh, we've built a lot of command and control centers in the in the cities in india today through the smart cities mission which was launched uh, way back in 2014 2015 actually uh, and uh, yeah today we are at a point where i think a, a bunch of our cities a good bunch of our cities are actually being monitored through these command and control centers and any sort of an incident that could be addressed because it's it's pretty much live monitoring the res the response could be quicker to these kind of incidents so yeah that's one one of these uh, one of those scenarios right. where implementations on smarter side were done through technology okay right mm -hmm. um so you know this actually kind of makes me wonder and think that like for example the city uh, banaras right which is a major religious hub in india yep. um how can that be transformed into a smart city so what would be the concept of smart in a city like banaras and what do you think would be the major challenges and how can they be solved for so so again uh, like i said a while back smart isn't one unidimensional first things first let's be very clear and so when it, when it comes to a city like banaras which has got by itself a like you just said a very rich heritage right uh, it's 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 a city that's that's known for its uh, it's uh, religious heritage, traditional heritage than anything else. And so uh, uh, when when you define smart for a city like that, you cannot purely consider uh, technology to do this for you. So if, if you look at the fact that Banaras right. has a lot of visitors coming down then there is there's that at some point during the year there is always a ga there's a gathering that that happens there and there is a lot of people that come down there uh, and because of which uh, there is an, uh, a concern around uh, uh, how how that crowd management would happen and all so you could possibly use a certain amount of tech to manage that to to kind of keep keep track of uh, mm -hmm. keep track of uh, dense crowds and things of that nature and probably help uh, uh, your your uh, or uh, security forces in terms of managing the crowd a little easy easily but having said that i think that's not the only thing for a city like that it's it's got to be a mix of how you manage to restore and also rejuvenate a lot of the cultural heritage which otherwise could be lost you do not want the city to lose its dna right. by any means that's very essential every city has got mm. its own dna and that's that's very important while you're considering your plans for any urban development in that context so uh, there are things like heritage walks that i've seen happen in cities i my my experience with cities in india have been predominantly down south but if i were to relate it to a city that i worked with in in karnataka this one is called shimoga it's got a very rich uh, mm -hmm. uh, heritage in that sense as well so so there again we kind of okay. made sure that uh, we are not losing sight of what 
uh, the, the DNA of the city is. And so we included things like the Heritage Walk, which could by itself be a unique experience for uh, a, a visitor or probably for the resident as well. And by itself could qualify to be uh, defined as a smart aspect for that city. So yet again, uh, the typical issues of water waste and all could remain and they have to be addressed. There's no running away from that. But all right. I'm trying to say is that you got to always address, mm. uh, look at the distinct aspects of what that one city that you're talking about has, and that cannot be ever overlooked. That's my point. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah. So um, uh, this also, you know, kind of, uh, like while you were saying this, this question popped up in my mind is that uh, the concept of smart is different for different cities, right? True. So who are the people who are deciding what is smart for that particular city uh, if, if you're talking about who's deciding to make uh, to make those projects happen and plans happen of course it's the administrative uh, side of things uh, so it, in in a, in a country like india with democratic country like india of course uh, we've got this system uh, which is uh, the government system is under three three layers there's a central government there's a state and then there's a local government so on the ground reality on the ground awareness of course comes from the local government which is in a, in a word you know in simple words the municipality that belongs to that city the urban local bodies like they're called uh, and so when they observe things what uh, about what's happening on the ground and they kind of translate that into ideas and potential projects they kind of have a validation of that okay. uh, at different levels before the projects by themselves get get into an approval stage and once approved the funds are allotted and then it's getting mm -hmm. implemented so there's a there's a chain of events that happens from observing and ideating at the ground level to taking it all the way to the top getting the approvals and then coming all the way bottom to implement it and then the the citizens or the residents of the city get to see the potential uh, benefits of that particular project so it's it's that's the way it works. The administrative side of uh, mm -hmm. uh, our our governments definitely has a key role to play, and of course the political uh, mm -hmm. uh, representatives also come in because they they also have a a very key stake in this but these kind of uh, engagements that that happen at an urban level. Right. So um, is there ever uh, you know some kind of uh, challenge in terms of citizens accepting what are the uh, changes that are being made in their particular city? or in terms of technological um, you know, adaptations? No, there always will be. I mean, there's no running away. Just as an example, I stay in Bangalore and Bangalore had, had this uh, smart city project that has been going on for a while now. And uh, uh, because of the pandemic, things got mm. delayed and all of it. Now, because of the fact that all of that has happened and the, the roads, this was about roads mm. development, smart roads, that's what they called. Uh, so essentially, the roads were dug up. This was in the central business district. So you could imagine the, the densest part of mm. the city in terms of traffic. But fortunately, because of the pandemic, the traffic wasn't hit too much. But what's happened ever since the pandemic got, uh, after the second wave, the pandemic got a little relaxed and uh, things started opening up, is that the shopkeepers got worried because the roads mm. in front of their shops were dug up. So there will always be that that heart right. burn, heart pain that will happen in some sections, and that is unavoidable in a, especially in a brownfield city. These are called brownfield projects because these are existing cities in which you are trying to bring up some new development mm. aspect. So this is not a greenfield. If it was a city right. that was being built ground ground up, you have an ample opportunity to mm. do this without uh, without uh, uh, making life tougher for any of the other people who are already staying in the city. So this is a brownfield one. So there will always be those things. Uh, having said that, uh, the way the smart city engagements in India have accounted for it is that when even at the point where I told you projects are getting identified and uh, then proposed for approvals, at that point itself, they've involved a lot of citizens in conversations to make sure that they have a majority of them on board. There's uh, hardly going to be a scenario where right. you've got everyone on everyone on board. There will always be diverse opinions, and that's that's the essence of uh, the human race in a certain sense. But uh, but but then yeah, the point is mm -hmm. there were there have been attempts to make sure that 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 particular friction areas are minimal as mm -hmm. minimal as possible. Uh, yeah, having said that, practical mm -hmm. is still practicalities still pop up uh, when you start implementing them. Yeah. Right. So, um, what is uh, what do you think, or rather, how do you see the European Indian partnership in term of uh, in terms of urban urban space? Okay, that's interesting one. European and Indian. So, the context of why, uh, European and Indian, I think, right. is relevant because of the fact that uh, yes, Europe, I would say, is, is what I would have called the developed world. 
uh, in the sense that uh, they, they definitely have the advantage of uh, the right infrastructure in place for their for their uh, urban setups uh, can compared to uh, the the kind of population they run with uh, we deal with a different po- challenge mm-hmm. which is of course the population is different and uh, and uh, and the problems areas that we are fighting in the context of the problem areas that we are fighting is different so while at the at the surface mm-hmm. you may think waste is a problem in europe waste is a problem in india what is a probably problem in europe what is probably a problem in india and energy water and all of these things mm-hmm. are, are something that you on the surface it may look so but having said that the the distinctiveness of the geography of the of the of the local context is what will be very unique and so what all all i could say is that in terms of leverage points between europe and india uh, possibly a few tech collaborations mm-hmm. uh, uh, tech transfers could help out here uh, but beyond that, I think it's, it's, there's never okay. going to be a situation where you could pick a solution from what has worked in Europe and directly apply it to India. It's it's rarely going to be that kind mm. of a scenario. And I'd say 90, 95% of the times you will have to definitely do a, a custom approach based on whatever you are thinking would be relevant from the success stories in the European mm. region. Right. Having said that, I think the funding aspects right. have been uh, one channel. The funds and the financial channels have been a great one between these two regions. Uh, I know of a couple of uh, couple mm. of uh, uh, collaborations that have happened between the Indian uh, government and the European governments, and uh, they have actually come forward mm. to the point where they've said, "Let's also kind of join hands while you are developing some cities." So they've collaborated with some particular cities in India, and they've said, "We'll jointly." make these cities better and that's 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 a great thing so those would be the uh, those would be great uh, areas where they, that collaboration could come to the fore but if you specifically look at uh, how right. project and ideas could be successful from there to here you'll have a challenge to direct fit mm-hmm. those ideas that's my point okay so like can you name a few of the cities where collaborations are happening or are happening rather yeah, there's a bunch of them. There's a bunch of them. Uh, the the ones that I can clearly think of is definitely in Bangalore. Uh, there's mm-hmm. pro- collaborations between Indian government and the Japanese government. Uh, there's there's also uh, okay. a bunch of collaborations that have happened uh, uh, in in greenfield cities, especially uh, where where mm-hmm. the European government uh, counterparts have come forward and they've said they wanted to kind of help. So there's there's different. Then there's water development areas where European parties do come forward and there's a lot of collaboration there so uh, i'm not sure on the top of the mind i could give you names but there's there's a whole lot of them that happen uh, on and off between these two uh, governments okay right right so uh, and Vijay, now i also know that uh, you're not just a practice practitioner of sustainability in your professional life but you're also a practitioner of sustainability in your personal life right Yes, yes. So, uh, you know, from a practitioner's point of view, uh, what are the different forms of uh, forms and practices of sustainability? Oh, that's interesting. So when I told you that smart in terms of smart cities is not unidimension, cannot be defined one way. I think sustainability mm-hmm. is equally mm-hmm. that it is never something that can be defined one way. What works for Antika and what Antika believes as sustainable would be very different from Anveshi. And that's the that, that's the beauty of the, the concept itself. Having said that, I think the end goal happens to be the same. We want to kind of be more true to our existence on Earth. And that's that's the essence of uh, of what we, we mean by sustainability. Uh, so for me and uh, right. the transition that I've had on the on my personal end, uh, we've uh, we've taken a decision to kind of uh, move go go to the greener side uh, of life. For a good four or five mm. years now, it's it's not been a, a quick transition. It's taken its time, but having said that, I think one thing led to another. We just started with something as simple as saying we'll do composting of waste at home. Nothing big. That's all we did. And uh, right. just because we started doing that, we said, okay, we maybe we should step it up. What do we step it up to? Because we are doing composting, mm-hmm. maybe we should have a couple of pots. Yeah, we did that. And then then we said, yeah. okay, why why are we so dependent on? Uh, on uh, the the uh, power and uh, water uh, departments to give us supplies can't we do something and so solar happened at our mm. then rainwater harvesting mm. happened then we bought an electric car then uh, so we it's it's come to a point where now when i am purchasing something as simple as a pen or a pencil i really think twice saying do i really need to be purchased because this one thing that i'm purchasing has right. of course got its own footprint right it's 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 come to that point where it's become yes so very 
a part of the uh, a very consciously so i would say a part of the daily life that you, hmm. you just don't know it's it's about that tipping point so when you reach that tipping point beyond that everything becomes just just a, a, a natural uh, process from there on so to a certain point you'll have to hmm. make decisions and decisions and decisions but thereafter it just becomes a natural part of your life so yeah i think today and that's that's one of the reasons why i switched over from what i was doing as uh, hmm. uh, smart cities for smart cities to what i'm doing today in terms of sustainable living so uh, the professional side of the uh, switch had a very strong basis on the personal side of the switch as well right right yeah. i think that's what uh, the point is right if we are not doing what we are preaching then how exactly how we you know sustainability practitioners very true very true very true um, yes and i guess the, you wouldn't mind if the audience listening to this podcast just drops you a message on linkedin saying hi and maybe how can i make my house sustainable in fact i'd be happy because that's one of those things we anyways do uh we and my company we f- yes. kind of help people individuals as well hmm. uh, kind of transition to the greener side and uh, more than happy to uh, in fact uh, as we progress maybe i'll also detail out but there is this beautiful tool that we've built it's called the green compass which has got a bunch of 150 hmm. odd actions that anybody any individual can just look at and see what it means to be sustainable and then of the 150 actions he or she can decide which one he or she wants to go with and then complete those actions come back to the tool and says look i've done that thing and then the tool will give you a wonderful visualization how your small action that you've just said completed has impacted the world out there through the direct correlation with the sdgs so it's it's a very beautiful gamified tool gives you digital badges nice leaderboards right. and all of it so i'd be more than happy to guide them on hmm. that front as well yeah now anishi you know what i also feel is that as much as individual actions are important to you know achieve the sustainability or the sustainability targets mm-hmm. uh, the corporates as well have a huge a huge role to play in this right mm-hmm. so i kind of want your perspective on that but mm-hmm. however uh, you know before that can you explain the audience or you know rather the young audience who are listening to this podcast mm-hmm. what corporate sustainability is in very simple terms mm-hmm. sure so sure. so let's let's get get things started on a on a very simple note so we all know that modi has made a big announcement about a month back i'm hoping that's something we are we've read in the news already which is to say india will go mm. into a net zero zone by 2070 although good bad early late i'm i'm not sure we're going to debate that here but there's an announcement of that sort now when somebody like uh, the the leader of the country is announcing that what it means is that all of the folks in the country uh, have to play some role in that i mean it cannot just happen through a magic wand and what does that mean you and me as individuals can do like you just said ayantika but beyond that there's also the scale at which this impact has to happen how will that be achieved right the scale is possible with huge participation from the private sector the private sector today is hmm. responsible for a lot of footprint directly or indirectly directly because their operations their, their businesses could possibly be throwing out some gases into the air uh indirectly or because mm-hmm. of multiple things one they could be consuming a lot of electricity which is being produced somewhere else using coal indirectly also because they may be taking their supplies from a uh, uh, from a supplier who is sitting way too far and that means that the cargo of their supply has traveled long distance to reach their place the indirectly also because right. uh, they may be producing something their product that they are finally producing could be something that has gone through a lot of lot of uh, uh, resources resource usage uh, in in its production as an example a denim jeans we've heard of it a lot i believe consumes a hell lot of water before mm-hmm. it becomes a denim jeans hell lot of water and so when we buy our denim jeans for a few hundred right. bucks out there we may not really think through that but then the point is that the corporate sector has a huge role to play in terms of how they look at their own operations their mm. own productions what they produce what they don't what is their uh, what are their different products etc and how do they how do they kind of preach it to their suppliers and all of it so if that is that is something that should happen then all of this will happen under the umbrella of what we call corporate sustainability that's the crux of it all if it helps right 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, like you were just mentioning, right, about this entire uh, debate about whether can India, uh, you know, kind of phase down its coal usage by 2070. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a whole debatable question, right? So, what do you think is the skepticism about corporate sustainability, which is going on in the market? So, it's not India particularly, but I'm just saying corporate sustainability in general has had a challenge with uh, a few it's it's like it's like uh, yeah. a, a, a few rotten tomatoes in a basket right so what what i mean by rotten tomatoes in this context is that there are corporates who have unfortunately gone down the route of what is called greenwashing right which is to say uh, they project to the world that they are doing good mm. but deep mm. inside they aren't yet doing good and so uh, these have come to the forum these, these uh, you cannot really be uh, duping everyone all the time there will be some point or the other when this will be caught and that has happened and unfortunately when you see something that has broken your trust and that's what's happened with these green for greenwashing uh, 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 culprits um, is that yeah there is that uh, loss of okay. belief in a certain sense so it's not just with with the general audience but even the regulatory bodies even the standard setting bodies have realized that this is something that has uh, shaken shaken a lot of faith that was otherwise there and so today what is happening is there's a lot of tightening of all these uh, all these aspects this can no longer be uh, a slip between the cup and the lip so you got to be very ma making sure that you are sticking to honest uh, uh, attempts to achieve corporate sustainability and not not just uh, greenwashing stuff so that's been one of these big challenges i would say not just in india again i would remind it's it's a, and it's a challenge that's that's been fairly mm. global in that sense right right yeah. so you know since you you just mentioned about greenwashing um uh, it's i think it's a lot because that uh, we as consumers are not uh, aware as to how to you know actually understand if a product is eco-friendly or sustainable or not right yeah, yeah. so um um so uh, do you believe that india should start relying upon public distribution uh, to achieve um, the objectives of corporate sustainability i can't really relate the two two concepts too well in my mind uh, but having said that what what i clearly know is that if the if the whole idea of going towards a, a better planet a livable planet addressing climate change has to be long lasting mm. Uh, it cannot happen without a huge amount of uh, transition in terms right. of our behaviors. So PDS, I don't know how PDS and, and its corporate sustainability could come together, but that's that's a, a thought that I'm mm. tr still trying to digest. But having said that, I, I one thing I'm clear about is that change uh, for this this decade is crucial, and that you may have yeah. heard of a lot of times in in, in news and stuff. Uh, this decade is crucial in terms of the immediate immediate need to address it, but once you address it, if you leave it to where it is, you will again go down this uh, the 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 down 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 path, which is not the great thing. So I would rather say, while this decade will be about immediate action, will be about possible uh, uh, leverage of technologies and nature-based solutions to bring down global warming mm -hmm. and all of it. Beyond that is what we also need to be looking at, and that's where mm -hmm. people and people behavior and people owned. Uh, transitions to sustainability mm. will be very crucial. Uh, it's it's uh, behavioral shifts take right. a long time. They take a long time, and that's the that's the word point that I'm making. And so, if you if you spend the next ten years uh, also looking at how we all could possibly impact uh, or rather shift our own behaviors, that'll be great. So, in that sense, yeah, people aspect right. could be right. brought into sustainability. Um, uh, besides this people aspect, we are also, you know, uh, sort of talking about uh, the business angle of it and how corporates are responsible, right? So, um, do you think it is uh, a foreseeable future mm -hmm. that um, corporates come together and, you know, they are able to bring down the use of rare earth materials? And uh, can you also sort of explain uh, corporate sustainability and uh, the relation uh, with mining? Okay, so so let me, let me then in that case answer that uh, with a very simple simple yeah. statement to start with. Just look around any uh, anything that's around you, anything that's around you, and I would say if you just identify an object randomly and think through, you would know that where it has come from, or rather the raw material that's gone into its making has its has its origin 
in mother earth mm. it ha cannot happen elsewhere even if it's plastic if metal mm. it's wood it's whatever fabrics things like that everything's got its origin in mother earth so talking of rare metals rare minerals rare rare substances that are being used in the corporate mm. context yes it's a very key aspect of what we call sustainability in the mm. in the private sector very key aspect even in, even uh, to the extent that uh, we we want to make sure that uh, it, it's got to be important that you got to look at how much are you able to really extract without harming the planet and that's important equally important and uh, so in the in that context there's this concept of urban mining right. that is coming to the fore uh, urban mining essentially is about saying your your uh, devices of course your laptops your e devices actually have a lot of a uh, lot of uh, metals in there and rare metals at that and these could possibly be recycled and reused for new products mm. again mm. Uh, and so how much of that can actually take replace your your uh, demand of raw material from uh, virgin material like mining and bringing them out from mother earth right so that's the attempt and in that context the fact that you asked me how practical and real is it to expect that the corporates mm. would be able to make that switch the regulations are falling in place okay uh the there has been for a good time good amount of time now uh, something called the epr right. uh, uh, which is the extended producer responsibility for uh, waste management in india and particularly for plastic waste and mm. e-waste uh, the fact that it hasn't yet achieved the success uh, is is something that is being discussed in the in the in the uh, uh, meetings that are happening at the mm. uh, committee levels but more importantly there will be tweaks to that and it will it will have its if its new avatar maybe and that will help even better but the point i'm making is every co company has now got an obligation to achieve a certain epr target right join that with the fact that the indian government uh, has also now regulated that the top 1000 companies in india have to submit what is called a business responsibility and sustainability report it's called the brsr right and that's that's mandatory every year right, they have right. to submit and if it's if you if you look at the, the the template the template for that report it is going to be very very precisely asking you how are you managing a b c d and by a b c d i mean the different types of uh, waste that is being generated in your company how are you uh, making sure that you don't don't really extract more water than what is required how are you making sure that your waste water is being recycled the right way and these are the kind of questions that kind of uh, are coming up in those reports and you have to file them year after year based on which the the regulatory body in this context it is the sebi the market regulator uh, security exchanges and uh, security exchanges board of india uh, so they will also be taking this to the point where they will rank companies at some point saying this company is doing mm. great on this front not right. so great there that company is doing great there and so once all of this becomes public information and you did uh, hear me talk about greenwashing and things like that all of this becomes public information transparency creeps in and then people will know for sure about where should they really go about if they were to support what is called uh, green consumerism right. right they can clearly make a decision based on that mm. aspect as well so the, there is this multi, multiple factors that are happening multiple aspects that are happening today and if you look at things the way they will come together in the next four to five years there is clearly going to be a lot more information available in the in the hands of the consumers for them to make the right decisions on where to invest where to buy where to kind of uh, go for uh, go for something that's more greener right right um so anveshi um since you just talk since we just talked about uh, circular economy and the epr system right um coming uh, sorry going back to the smart cities concept right so i believe there must be some foundations or check boxes that are there to understand or to term a city smart or not right um, so if a city uh, has a proper waste management system right where this entire circular economy is in process would you call that city smart uh, the, i mean honestly if you look at the every every city out there one thing that is uh, what is a problem or a challenge with with them is definitely waste management right uh, it's it's a problem that's that's been there for a while now and it's definitely there so having 
tick that box you definitely have addressed a big issue that the cities face but does is that the be all and end all no it cannot mm. be that's the point so in the in the in the recent scheme of things the recent uh, 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 focus areas on the cities front waste is definitely one but along with that uh, the ministry of housing and uh, and urban affairs mm. in india which which uh, runs the smart city mm. mission as well uh, happened to kind of in the last couple of years come out with something called climate smart okay. cities right and this is this is also uh, this they've developed a framework of what a climate smart city would be and they are then saying you will be each year assessed as a city on this framework you you would have heard of this thing called the uh, mm. swachh sarvekshan which is essentially yeah. how neat and clean a city is uh, indore keeps stopping mm. it for the last five years now uh, and they they do something called a swachh sarvekshan ranking so indore gets to know its number 1 because there's a ranking out there on mm. similar lines the climate smart framework that is coming from the mohua mm. ministry of housing urban affairs uh, will is ranking already is ranking cities on climate resilience how resilient is your city to potential changes or potential potential impacts of climate uh, uh, emergencies uh, mm. these days rains are erratic monsoon kind of hits you know from nowhere landslides happen and things like that uh, and for that matter even even the summers are erratic uh, so how are you resilient how are you making sure that you are considering those vagaries of nature that are unfortunately happening because of whatever wrongs we have done till now so mm -hmm. there are there is a ranking of that sort so when it comes to smart in the in the sense of where we are today it's definitely beyond a one mm. point solution like waste management it's got to be a lot more aspects that have to happen right so you know this question going on popping up in my mind is that uh, we um we understood that uh the concept of smart is not universal for all the cities right and uh, second is that uh, by just solving one particular issue you cannot call a city smart right so what are the few check boxes which are there or the f uh, fundamental check boxes which have to be ticked to call a city smart i mean i know you've been asking the question in different ways but i'm, I'm at a point where i don't think there's an answer to that only because you cannot like we discussed uh, banaras and what banaras can consider smart bangalore may not look at it the same way uh, but if you were to still kind of hand time hands and ask me i would say yeah there is waste management there is water management there is energy management which is the crux of the basic amenities that mm. a city would expect and then there is of course mm. the transport and traffic so if if those are in place i think you are pretty much a day day in the life of a typ typical urban uh, mm. citizen is is more or less revolving around these four or five concepts uh, but but then those are the basic amenities honestly i don't want to go down to call that that an aspect of smart because that becomes a, a, a very low mm. low hanging benchmark uh, in a certain sense because that's that's a basic denominator of every city you cannot really call, make make a, a claim mm. a city to be smart just because those have been achieved i would want to kind of say those being achieved is the foundation that needs to be there and then on top of which you build experiences for your citizens that kind of truly stand out and they they love the city like like they do like they do mm. nothing right so so that's the point at the end of the day what your citizens want to have is mm. basic amenities and once that basic amenities mm. are sorted we definitely want to kind of step it up and say now uh, we want to have something that makes us happy and uh, in fact a lot of cities uh, dubai for an example uh, mm. uae not dubai you has has a as a uh, dedicated minister who looks after what is called a uh, minister of, i think the ministry is called ministry oh, of happiness okay. right uh, so so that's the point that they you got to go beyond go beyond the basic amenities and then look at uh, these aspects to kind of understand where do you want to stand out for okay. your citizens if you keep sticking to the the basic uh, amenities then you will probably not be able to step it up okay all right okay um so coming back to you know corporate sustainability yeah. right uh, in the previous question that i had asked about um you know uh, using rare earth metals etc you mentioned about uh, brsr right so um you know for uh, corporates there are so many uh, reporting matrices what do you think is the best matrix to showcase the environmental and social sustainability so the reason we have different matrices is also because uh, and, and that's something that hasn't been very 
uh, I mean, it's been a challenge for a while now. In fact, uh, just so that you know, the last six months, mm-hmm. six to eight months, uh, there's a consolidation of these uh, diverse matrices that's happening. Uh, so the popular ones are uh, five or six. I'll just name them mm-hmm. quickly. Uh, we have something called GRI. Uh, we have uh, CDP. We have SASB, CDSB, uh, IIRC, and uh, TCFD. Mm-hmm. So those are, of course, this is there's a whole lot of alphabet soup out there in terms of uh, different abbreviations. Mm-hmm. Uh, but more importantly, um, the there is a reason, like there's, there's a lot of thinking and uh, work happening today in terms of consolidating them into one. Uh, as we speak, uh, the IIRC team and the SASB teams have come together and they've become the Value Reporting Foundation, VRF. Uh, there's a talk of the CDSB team also joining that coalition and becoming one. And then there'll be over a period of time and it's, it's going to in that direction in the next couple of years where it'll all get consolidated into more or less one standard reporting framework right today there's there's a bunch of them uh, because of the the various dimensions or facets through which they approach sustainability mm-hmm. like a gri has a focus on uh, on what is called social economic and uh, environmental sustainability so they don't really look at sustainability in one sense okay. only right so they look at all these three dimensions and that's that's the approach that gri takes uh, something like a cdp takes uh, three different dimensions at this point, uh, climate change, water, and forests. So they, they kind of look at sustainability in that sense. Uh, then there is uh, the other ones like the, uh, the CDSB and the IIRC, which are looking at saying, you also as a corporate produce something called an annual report. Right. You also possibly produce something called a sustainability report. How do me as the person who's got access to both your reports, be able to easily understand how one relates to the other because i cannot really have two different reports which are so independent that i cannot relate one to the other Mm. if it's an annual report at the end of the day there's got to be some way for me to Mm. relate a to b and that's the focus of those two two particular standards the this is this is this is what i'm saying so they look at different uh subsets of what would be relevant and all of these are relevant honestly and so the the whole direction in which this is heading is that there's a consolidation of sorts happening between these folks and they it's a realization that they've themselves had for a while now and they're putting in their own efforts today to make that consolidation happen so in the next couple of years which what you mentioned in your question as a multitude of uh, sustainability yeah. reporting uh, standards uh, will will consolidate and become more or less one and that that's going to be the state that all of us like today unfortunately mm. we're not there right okay okay so um yeah so to so i don't think that that still answered your question because there's no best mm-hmm. there's no best standard they, each of them has a different aspect right. that they focus on and that's that's what makes them uh, okay. distinct got today it, got it so uh anveshi um how do you uh, think that in india or rather how can corporates in india uh, support the prisoners for sustainability initiatives and i'm particularly asking this question because you know when we talk about sustainability the usual uh, ideology that comes into our mind is that you know working for the environment right but it has got three pillars environmental social and economic mm-hmm. so focusing on those three pillars how do you think can corporates in india um, support the prisoners for sustainability initiatives and should there be a policy for that should there be policy is i think a fairly straightforward one because you cannot not have a policy okay. you need to have one how is is a very interesting question so uh, so there's this uh, when when the un had come up with this whole idea of uh, sustainability and uh, through the sdgs of course they had also almost at the same time concurrently brought out something called uh, 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 the idea of what is called just right. transition uh, just transition is essentially saying for you to move from where you are to the state of being greener we are currently unfortunately in a brown and gray economy kind of a state we are saying the world has to move towards a green economy that's that's something that's fairly nice and straight to say but that that transition from the brown to gray or brown to green sorry has a lot of like you said repercussions possibly in on different sections of the society you at some point asked Hmm. about the coal sector right of the mining that happens in the coal sector so the if you were to say tomorrow coal mines would be shut down and which is on the horizon in the sense that maybe under 10 15 years down the we we'll, we would have almost uh, peaked on the amount of coal usage and from there it's only downwards there's not going to be an upward trend on coal 
so if that is that is what it is of course if as the supply or as the demand comes down the supply mm. will come down the supply comes down the industries will face a challenge to cut down on their production and of mm. course the people will get impacted and by people i don't mean the people who are working in the coal sector only uh in states like jharkhand where coal mines are huge huge right. uh, in terms of the the number of mines out there uh, there's a whole lot of indirect uh, dependency mm. on these coal mines indirect dependency in the sense that there's the, the 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 district in which these mines are cannot really think of what could happen to the district's uh, people because their livelihoods are so dependent on the coal right. uh, business out there not directly again they may not be working in the coal mine but because of the fact that there's that industry there's mm. a thriving economy around it right uh, whether it's about the guys who who transport the coal from uh, the the mines to wherever the, that's the transport folks or probably the the different people that are making that city bustle and hustle uh, because of the fact that there's enough people so that's right. the kind of transitions that i'm talking of you got to look at how you will be able to address that uh, one is direct impact which is of course where you look at skilling mm. and reskilling approaches mm. that could help there but even beyond that there's a huge re- impact that will happen on the indirect side how do you address that and that's where uh, things like the just transition that i right. mentioned a while back from the un would be important in fact in india uh, also that's getting a lot of attention uh, i was very recently listening to a webinar uh, where where uh, uh, very prominent uh, personalities and political representatives were talking about uh, how it is important to consider uh, just transition over a period of time not 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 something that is mm. a knee jerk approach but over a period of time to make sure that the the impact on uh, the lesser privileged mm-hmm. sections of our society unfortunately is reduced that's that's one mm. take on on what you asked the other take is of course the fact that climate emergencies floods and things of that nature that come keep happening more regularly if they hit someone hard it is unfortunately the the poorer sections correct it is not the the uh, if if i were to say the haves and the have nots it impacts the have nots a lot more mm. and so to address that uh, we need to make sure that the in even in the cop 26 that happened very recently there was a lot of talk of how funds are required to achieve the uh, loss uh, that that is happening because of these climate emergencies mm. so you, there's there's funds that are required to transition to green economy but equally at the same time there's enough funds and money required right. to address the climate challenges and the repercussions that are already happening right. today already happening today so there's so many so many aspects that have to happen in tandem to address mm. uh, that particular social mm. aspect right right this kind of also uh, uh, brings this this thought in my mind that um there's this concept called human capital right which is again one yep. of the key aspects uh, towards achieving sustainability yep. right so um talking about human capital how do you think mm-hmm. uh, other corporates you know the lgbtq community the children and uh, you know the human disabilities for sustainability i can i can hardly think of good examples and that may be because i'm too uh, unaware i'm not saying there's nothing mm-hmm. happening out there i may be unaware of of what's happening out there in that particular aspect but having said that where i think diversity is probably being addressed in in the the indian context in the indian corporate mm. context is definitely to start with uh, the fact that women have to take take the 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 uh, bull bites horns uh, out here uh, if you look at again we talked of climate emergencies and thing uh, that the aspect that impact uh, the society at large right that impact on the women folk the the is is huge i mean or if you look at a family that's getting impacted by a, a climate emergency uh, you cannot imagine how it impacts the ladies and girls that are that are part of that particular uh, society uh, so it's it's a very very crucial aspect uh, in terms of the fact that we need to address social uh, uh, aspect of sustainability but social aspect through the lens of a woman and if if that was to happen i don't think corporates and the boardrooms that are uh, that are running these corporates cannot can do this without having the voice of a of a, a leader mm-hmm. who's who's on the feminine side to kind of right. drive those points home it it is something that's very important and that's probably a realization that's happening uh, in that sense diversity is something that's coming to the fore uh, uh, not not 
aggressively but definitely better than where mm. it where we were maybe a few years back so that's to the extent that i'm aware of but beyond that uh, when you talk of things like the lgbtq things like probably uh, uh, the disabled friendliness of these initiatives no i can't think of too many examples honestly at the top of my mind i may be unaware and uneducated mm. on okay. that front so uh, since you mentioned about diversities right so how how does one address demographic diversities in the employee groups uh, so this is within a corporate context again yeah. i'm assuming so yes um, so yes i think i think there there are, there are ways to kind of pull that off uh, in the sense that uh, you got to make sure you hear every voice out there or rather you got to engage every voice out there uh, because the point is again like we said a while back sustainability seen through your eyes versus my eyes is two different things mm. although we may belong to the same uh, homogeneous group mm. in this case the employee group it it is it isn't so easy in, uh, for ev everyone to look at things the same way so you as the the person who's part of the leadership team me as the person who's uh, a part of the employee uh, groups maybe we both do not have the same same view right. uh, and in that very sense uh bringing them together listening to them at the same point and making engaging them together is super crucial so there are ways to do it there are ways to do it in this in fact i did a very uh, very recently i did a, a short two minute video and i put that up on my linkedin where i talk of how employee engagement on sustainability mm. is super crucial so there are ways to do it in the sense that um, you can get them to participate and come up with ideas to address what your challenges on sustainability are Right. So this is this is an aspect of you saying, bring them all together. Let them do what is called a design thinking kind of a mm. discussion and a workshop, where they ideate, they test, they prototype, they come out with solutions. All that you have to do is give them the challenge. And honestly, uh, you got to be clear about the fact that they know what's working on what's not working on the floor, on the actual operational floor, better than any leader who's probably right. sitting in the boardroom. And I'm not. by any means saying uh, demeaning the boardroom folks it's the fact that these guys are uh, the the guys on the shop floor guys on the operational floor are living this day in day out so bringing them into the conversation making them stakeholders making them participative is is an awesome way to kind of make make sustainability a success mm. for the corporates uh you could also give them uh, i told you about this thing called the green compass which right. we have on our website a while back we you could also get them to engage on those kind of tools get them to also start their transition the behavioral change which i said is super crucial for the next 10 years also also is equally important within that employee group give them those kind of tools make them access them learn sustainability start practicing it get get challenged with hurdles and whatever failures all of those are part of the journey but you got to really make make that enabling atmosphere happen for your diverse uh, employee groups to really uh have a sense of connect with your corporate sustainability right, initiatives right. what are the uh, initiatives or other if you can you know uh, just tell about few initiatives that you are doing differently and you know is impacting differently for this entire corporate sustainability space or the social sector in Uh, general okay so you need to say you with you talking of uh, me and yeah. the team that i lead that's what you're asking right okay cool uh, yeah so couple of things that i think we are doing and uh, i'm i'm not sure how unique and distinct it is because there's a lot of lot of new ideas that are coming out there pretty much every week uh, from from new uh, young uh, entrepreneurs uh, so but having said that i think couple of things that we are challenging ourselves with uh, one is the fact that we are in the in the whole uh, uh, business let's say of uh, changing behaviors we are not doing anything else but trying mm. to change behaviors and that's not an easy easy right. uh, thing to achieve Tran changing behaviors is the toughest of challenges and that's still what we want to go for and by behaviors i'm not talking of behavior of an individual only which is also important so i my behavior antika's behavior is equally important but more importantly we are also talking of mm. institutional behavior how corporates look at sustainability how are they approaching this whole thing i told you at the beginning of our conversation about the fact that this uh, the how how a corporate's product mixes the genes that i example that i gave you should you go ahead and produce genes versus something else is something that is equally important so institutions have to also change their behaviors to to adopt to sustain so we are in that business of uh, of uh, driving behavioral change both individual and institutional 
that's one of those key things and we are leveraging a lot of uh, technology uh, aspects and a lot of uh, toolkits that we have developed to make that happen uh, again uh, that's that's one part the other thing that we are doing very distinctively very very importantly also is that we are approaching this as a challenge of an ecosystem okay. sustainability is not a challenge of a corporate not a challenge of uh, of a particular section of the society not not something that is a challenge of a particular individual or a particular public leader etc etc it's a challenge of the ecosystem that right. we are a part of so if if we are looking at any any sustainability challenge in the context of the different segments of clients we engage with we engage with corporates we engage with schools we engage with uh, individuals we engage with uh, societies the residential societies the gated communities also and even beyond that with, with uh, government bodies at different times uh, we are very clear that when we talking of one thread with one particular customer type we are at the back of our mind keeping uh, keeping ourselves thinking about how this particular thread could possibly impact the rest of mm. the society so you may want to very rightfully so in uh, having having the right intentions to do something and you may be doing something but you may probably be blind to the fact that because of you doing this and doing this because you are intending right unintentionally unintentionally you may be causing a mm. problem somewhere else so that's the concept mm. of systems thinking uh, so if you, if you look at how we are all interconnected and solving one problem could actually bring out a new one which you hadn't thought of when you were right. implementing your solution so we take that approach of a ecosystem we take an approach of that systems thinking to make sure that the impact is truly assessed in in a 360 degree sense you cannot really be looking at it from one dimension and losing sight of the others so that's the other thing that mm. we're doing differently uh, both of them are equally uh, the 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 first one which is about behavioral change the second one which is about ecosystem approach both of them are equally challenging but i think that's the thrill of what mm. we're doing and yeah glad to do, do that and go on right. with it i think that is the beauty of sustainability again right uh, yeah. while you're trying to solve uh, for one problem right you then are you know sort of pushed to think beyond the boundaries because you have to uh, understand if it is how it is exactly it is impacting the social sector or the economic part or the environmental part right true very important yeah so anveshi uh, for for different stakeholders what should be the take away regarding corporate sustainability according to you in when you talk of stakeholders and corporate sustainability um, my thinking is that there's a diverse set of stakeholders <clears throat> and that's why they call stakeholders Correct. your cons consumer is a stakeholder your employee is a stakeholder your investor is a stakeholder your uh, suppliers are your stakeholders your dealers are your stakeholders and so uh, your regulators are your stakeholders so there's so many th so many different stakeholders so uh, what is important is to make sure that you are giving due importance to each of them in your decision making and that's what i meant by 360 degree even the community i'm for, i'm sorry i forgot but even the community that is that is probably being uh, being uh, impacted by you directly or indirectly is a stakeholder uh, so when you do your csr kind of mm. projects you may be doing the right thing for the community but then are you really considering what is going to be relevant for them today tomorrow day after etc right. is important so right. it's it's important for you to look at all the stakeholders and the mix of stakeholders and the fact that each of them of course of course uh, rightly so uh, approach this whole thing very differently they look at the idea of uh, idea of what's relevant in their context very differently and so uh, an investor versus consumer may look at things differently of course an employee mm. versus your uh, supplier may be again having a different take on it for a corporate leadership team it is about that striking that balance of uh, understanding what each of these stakeholders mean for you mm. placing them in the right places in terms of giving them giving them and their their perspectives due credibility and then identifying based on all of that how and where do you want to position yourself right it it's a complex system it's a complex system and you will always have a somewhere or the other a, a tough decision to make mm. because you cannot really have a, 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 a magic wand which which kind of takes care of this diverse mix mm. so 
so yeah so you got to be at the top of your game be aware of the repercussions look at things from a holistic perspective a 360 degree perspective and then make your decisions if you are well educated well informed in making your decisions i'm sure to a good extent your stakeholder mix could be could be equally engaged and happy right Thank you so much Anveshi for sharing your knowledge with us today. I learned a, really a lot about corporate sustainability sure. today and as well about smart cities. Thank you for being here. Super, super. Thanks a lot Andhika and uh, best of luck for everything you're doing. Thank you so much Anveshi. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Sustainability Under Microscope. To share your feedback about this episode or for any topic suggestion, please reach out to me on LinkedIn or Instagram. The handles for both are mentioned in the description box. Or you can even email me on sustainabilityundermicroscope at gmail.com. If you like this episode and learned something today, please support my work by following this channel and turning the notification on so that every time a new episode is released, you are notified. Until next time, my dear listeners, adios.